Eight o'clock. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I'm on time. I'm here. I'm alive. A very, very quiet morning here in the Saxa. It's going to be crazy later on in the day, but it's quiet right now. It's going to be hot. Not super hot. It's a bit overcast. And there's going to be rain. Bit by bit, the clouds are going to gather and we're going to get uh, pretty much soaked later this afternoon and evening. We have a floater. Nice floater this morning. Good morning, good morning. Back to our normal camera slash audio setup. <laughs> Things are what they are. So there's still, you can see here, the semi. Every now and again, one gets latched onto the tree out front here. Then we get the real full concert. But what you're hearing is, of course, from the Temple Garden. It's about a block, well, half a block away. Show and tell. Show and tell, show and tell. Delivery. Delivery yesterday. Nothing to do with the stream. Packages get just left on my desk. So. Kubota san sent some prints. Paper is out. Paper is out. We have a printer working today. You probably see her. She'll drop in, I think, on her way upstairs. Ishikawa san today. And she doesn't really want to come in this week because we're nominally on a lockdown here. Talk about it later. But there are deadlines involved. And she's working on the September print. Now, the first batch is done and through. So the prints that will be mailed on September 1st, they are ready. The batch Ishikawa-san has, they're the batch that will be uh, sent out on September the 11th. So there's no panic here. She's got three weeks to get this done. Audio is low, no problem. We are back to our normal settings, so I'll try and boost it up a bit. Testing one, two, three. I'm speaking into the Mac here, which has a very good audio pickup. I just boosted it a little bit. I'll probably mumble when I get over here or something, but whatever. The package from Kobota-san, I can't really show it to you. Well, we can open it. It's our usual white green tape. And again, he always puts the little tab. He folds it over to make it easy for the person who is opening. Somebody says it's going to be a bit louder. I don't know. It's it's up now almost over the maximum we've ever had it before. So I don't know. Okay, here's his prints. I'm not going to be able to show you the full print. But I can let you know what it is. And that's enough to tell you probably most of you will understand what's inside here. It's another batch. Another batch of... Okay, in order that we don't break our terms of service with Twitch, we're doing well with them, we have no black marks. I'm not really going to be able to, to show you this thing, but it's another batch of prints from Kubota-san, and he has done a really, really, really nice job. And for those of you who are waiting, some people are waiting for the version of this print that doesn't have text on it. There's two versions, one version with text and one version without text. And he has done some of the ones without text for us. Very nicely. There's been people waiting because last time we printed a batch of these, I forgot to ask the printer to do that. So we've had a bunch of people who are waiting for the version with no text. And he has done, well, as far as I can see so far, he has done a very nice job. We have double hairlines here. You know, there's two blocks. Very, very delicate work on the hair. If I turn it around, can we see it a bit better? So, very feathered edges on both hairlines here. Kubota-san is good at this, absolutely good at this. Okay, that'll go out to our packing ladies now, and the people who've been waiting for this, it's on the way. 
it's on the way. It won't be on the way today, but it'll be on the way Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. Is there a version with just text and no image? I didn't really consider doing that. But I don't know. No, but we can make one if you want. <laughs> so. Okay, let's find our position and get to work. Just a minute while I find the camera spot here. Okay, well, let's do this for a start. Let's start there. Are the crows active today? It's the weekend. I can guess maybe Friday night was busy night for the bars last night because it's, you know, it's the weekend. There's a lots of the bars. They do nominally pack up and clean up their garbage, but when it's Friday night and they know that Saturday and Sunday are coming, they don't do a totally thorough cleanup. So I, th I imagine there's a little bits of bags of garbage here and there and food scraps and stuff. So the, the crows, I'm sure, enjoy the weekend much more than the weekdays because the number of people, the number of meals, the number of bars, the number of drunks throwing stuff around. So I imagine the weekends are the, uh, the crow time. Oh, also too, there is news, quite big news. Before I forget, let's get this news out of the way. It's related to the VOD, the video on demand on the Twitch channel. A couple of weeks back, I got a note from Coding Gummy, one of our mods here, who told me that there, he had become aware of a change in the policy of storing videos. Our videos have been stored on Twitch for, for two weeks. 14 days has been the storage time, and after that they disappear. So with 14 days, we stream three days a week. That means there's usually five or six videos have been on storage. They're changing the rules, they're cutting it down to one week. Coding Gummy let me know about this. But we talked about this here on this chat, and somebody let me know that if you're a Prime member or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Amazon Prime members get longer time. I forget the, the derivation of the story. Anyway, I looked into it. Mokohankan here, not Dave personally, Mokohankan has an Amazon Prime account. So I went into the settings at both ends, tried to match them together, and was able to do that. I told our Amazon account that I am a gamer streaming on Twitch and linked the two channels together. And it said something like, good, Dave Bull, looking forward to seeing what you download to start playing first. Well, I didn't download anything to start playing first, but the two accounts are now linked together. And looking at the VOD page on our account now, I see that videos all the way back to August 1st are still there and haven't been erased. So it looks like we have now an extended storage for our videos. And the documentation said for Amazon Prime members, videos are stored for 60 days, two months. This is true or not, I don't know, but at the moment there are videos still there dating back to August 1st. So it looks like we're going to have a longer time frame for people to see the archived videos here on Twitch. Hacking? That's not hacking. What do you mean? What game will I play? I am not going to touch that stuff. Believe me, I'm not going to touch it. Like, I have time for that. No, I don't. I'm sorry. So I have interest. Me and my daughters did play some rudimentary computer games. We were masters of cheese toast back in the day. And we, of course, everybody knows about the mist thing. Me and my daughters uh, went through many of the games from Ubisoft. But no, I'm not... Uh, I'm not in any way about to get interested in video gaming. There's room for some stuff in life. And at my age now, with a number of jobs waiting for me to get done, I can't justify. I can't justify gaming, sorry. Maybe it's my inability to do the work-life balance thing, I don't know. But just no way.
so many people. Back in the old days, I say the old days, I mean three years ago or so, when we still had a shop here, when the, when the shop was active, and especially when that video game documentary was playing, any number of people who visited the shop here came in and said, Dave, I knew I was going to visit Mok Hong Kong, but I didn't realize there was two game arcades within one block of your place. And there are. We have a title station in the back alley, and we have an Ad, 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 Adores game station another block away. And people would come in and say, Dave, 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 I found it, the two-man Mario Kart. we got to play it together. Oh my God, the, the universe is going to explode. And they want to beat me up on this Mario game, but uh, you know, I always said no, no, no. Yeah, I'm sure there are interesting games. Absolutely, it's it's a thing. I know, I'm sure there are games that I would enjoy and would like. I even actually have a couple of ideas for games, but, but it's just, there's enough, you know, there's enough. There's a limit to how much stuff you can put on your table. And that was the day when I was younger. I used to just grab the next shiny thing and the squirrels and everything else, and I'm trying these days not to do that. I wrote a game, actually, now that I think about it, I remember I wrote a game for our Commodore pet. <laughs> I wonder if the code is still in the box We had a CBM, it wasn't called a Commodore PET, we had the machine that followed that, called a Commodore CBM, Commodore Business Machine. It was 80 by, 80, 80 by 40 lines, I think. Okay, let's get carving. I don't, I don't want to carve the borderline right now, but some of these internal lines hit the borderline. So if I just started to carve the internal line of this, the borderline wouldn't be straight. So I got the straight borderline in place first. It's in there. You saw me go through. And that'll, that'll allow me now to carve the fruit line here. Without, uh, without too much problem. And we have a, a, a question of how to do this. Because again, Jed has just drawn these lines at whatever scale. He probably works at quite a large scale. His computer monitor draws the things. They look pretty good to him. He sends me the file away it goes. But once we scale it down and shrink it down to what we're doing here, it's not just that the picture becomes small, but the lines that he drew became extremely thin. And that's okay in places, but it's not okay in other places. A thin line is all right by itself. This thin line here on these leaves is going to be no big deal because there's going to be probably orange on both sides of it. But this one, it'll be a dark color for the table and a vivid color for this one. And the thinner the line is, the more accurate the printers have to be with their registration. And it makes everything, everything stressful for them. Audio, audio, here we go. Outside audio is too loud? No, it's the crows that are busy, I think. The AMA, you're talking about AMA. <laughs> I say it was a disaster, I, I, that's, not, that's not true. I guess it was a session people enjoyed. It, what's the word to use? Not a disaster. I was frustrated. I had wanted to do it much better. It's the same old story with Dave. I had wanted to do it, and I had prepared to do it, and I had planned to do it much, much, much better. That's all. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> After it was over, I shut the machine and walked away and said, oh, Jesus, you've screwed up again, Dave, you know. I guess we didn't screw up, but I just I wanted it to be so much uh, better, smoother. OBS, this software, is really pretty sophisticated. Really, really it is. But there are, there are limits to what you can do with it, obviously. And it's also not to diss the guys who have built this, because this is uh, open source software. It's pretty buggy. 
it really is pretty buggy there. The same setting won't take twice. It just whatever. I don't want to talk about it now here. Not not worth it. But uh, even when you think you've got it set up, it doesn't come back to the same setup because you you did one, two, three, four, five, and then you do the next time one, three, two, four, five, and it doesn't work the same way. So things that are unrelated to it. Anyway. I'll watch it later, I guess. I haven't watched it yet. But, uh, I think the main merit of having that AMA was getting Jed involved because I'm here all the time. I'm always talking about this stuff, but it's rare to hear from Jed. Jed is such a busy guy. So that's the, that to me, that was the big advantage, getting a chance to talk to Jed. And I should read the chat and see because he was busy answering questions there while I was just making noise. And, I guess it was fun, I guess. I don't know. So someone said, I should read the chat. Yes, I should. I should just watch the whole stream when I get some time. But uh, Someone says, new fancy camera. No, it's the same camera we've been using for quite a long time now. This, this camera has been doing good service for a couple of years. Uh, I'm sure there could be a camera with higher resolution, 4K or something. But uh, this camera does what we need to do. And I've gradually learned how to use it and get it set properly. Smooth. You don't hear any crunch, crunch, crunch with this stuff, not at this scale. This is cutting butter. Here, a little bit of there. When I go cross grain, you get a tiny bit of the crunch. Also, too, now I have got to get going on this block. This is the, um, which block is it? This is the October print. And uh, it won't be long before the printers are waiting for their chance to have a go at it. That's what I was looking for. Do you see it in there, the little triangle? I was busy talking while we were doing this when I was going around that curve. Again, did you see it? Nobody noticed it, I think. You didn't hear the pop. But as I was going around that corner, we broke the tip off again, <laughs> which is why I'm cleaning up. I had to find it. <laughs> we broke the tip yet again. So I don't know now. I don't know. This blade is looking... This blade is looking... We're looking at you, blade. I don't know.
So we're going to need a sharpening in a minute here. And before I do the sharpening, we're going to have to pull the blade out. The blade is getting too short. So we probably won't see that very often. So let me finish clearing this middle of this uh, tomato. <coughs> Not. And then we'll get to work on the, on the knife. insurance there. I've got to cut up now, cut up to the line. And I'm really not sure how deep my cut was. So I just did an insurance cut, just made that cut on the line there just a little bit deeper so that we can do this without uh, too much danger. Maybe still not quite deep enough. Yep, not popping out here. It's the wood grain. The wood grain slopes down in that direction, so. Now this is slice off. Yeah. That's gone a bit deeper than we really should have gone. Because the wood grain slopes down, and as I went sliding this way, the knife, the chisel was actually cutting down a bit deeper than it needed to go. So we've excavated here quite a bit more than we needed to excavate. Okay, we're okay. She's a little bit deeper than it needs to be, but no big deal. It's not going to hurt anything. And here, maybe, yeah, it's a bit high. It's a bit high on this part, so shave this down a bit. And shave it down, lots of pressure on the top of the chisel here. We're going against the grain. And it will tear. So lots of pressure on the top, small strokes. Good to go. Okay. Let's do some maintenance on the knife. Oh, Australia. Somebody's mentioning Australia. 
that reminds me, there's uh, an Australian news. Not really, it's news. It's an YouTube recommended something to me the other day. I'll just pop this in before I forget it. This is a link from YouTube. It's a link to a YouTube video. Not something I did. In the Watanabe Print Company back in the 1950s, this would be 57 or 1958, one year after Hasui died, made a, a movie, a mini movie. I guess it was 16 millimeter or eight millimeter. I don't remember. It was one of those old kinds where you held a little camera and brrr, it, it made actual, it was whole movies of the day back in the 1950s. They made a movie about Kawase Hasui making a woodblock print, which turned out to be one of his very, very, very last prints. He was dying. I guess they knew it, but they made this movie. Anyway, and Watanabe published that as a movie years and years and years and years ago, and it used to be done, it showed some parts of it in newsreels in movie theaters here in, in Tokyo back in the 1960s and so. Good morning! Hello! 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 coming in, as I said, her paper is out. Anyway, we've had copies of this old Hasui movie for a long time, but the audio was terrible. It was dubbed onto video. The audio was no good. Somebody, somewhere along the line, has cleaned it up, and it is now on YouTube, the link I put there. And the person who has put it up on YouTube is one of the watchers of the stream. He's not here right now. He's in Australia, so he's still sleeping, I guess, in... in not sure what part of Australia he's in, but I don't remember. And he wouldn't want me to talk about it. He'll talk about it if he wants to talk about it. But... Uh, yeah, Hasui died in 57, so this must have been 1956, one of the last uh, sketching trips and printmaking trips he did before, uh, before he passed away. Anyway, this is a really, really nice copy of a video, sl movie slash video, that has only up till now been available in terrible, awful copies. So if, I don't know where this came from, but this gentleman that uploaded it, whether he has edited it or just he found it somewhere, I don't know. But there it is. If you're interested in this printmaking, grab it. Take a look at it. Same time zone as me, Australia. Also, yeah, East Coast Australia. I don't know, I'm sorry. It's 8.27 here. Anyway, okay, okay. Anyway, as I said, we're gonna sharpen this thing, but the part now here is too short. So we've got to pull the knife out. Normally that would really be simple. You just open it up, pull it out, and put your put your your uh, collar back on. But my collar is kind of a little bit worn out, and my knife is kind of a little bit worn out due to the fact that I sharpen it at really sometimes quite a low angle, as we've seen, you know, from the Itosan video and stuff like this. And the, the channel has become worn out and it's loose. So I'm going to have to. I've got lots of little shims in there. We'll pop it out. Look at this, it's wrapped with tape to make it stiffer. Pull it forward. This is the thing, if I pull it forward just a little bit, then I gotta do this again next week. If I pull it forward too much, then the knife is gonna be too long to comfortably use. Okay, we've pulled it forward that much. How much is that much? We've pulled it forward about five millimeters. Collar goes back on, I think. I, I can't reach the tape over there by the office, so let's see if we can just put this back on. I don't know. I'm not trying to conserve tape here, just I don't have any tape at my desk here, so whatever. It's okay, we got away with it. We got away with it. Okay, so the blade has been pulled out another five millimeters. How many times can we do that? Maybe six more times before we lose, before we lose it. Okay, that's it, it's pulled out, let's sharpen. But we still have the problem now, we've broken it now three or four times within just like one foot of carving distance. So the suspicion is that the steel at this point on the blade is really, really not uh, not so good. I'm not being the poor workman who blames his tools here, because I, of course, I end up breaking the knife lots of times. But the fact that we've broken it once, twice, three times now under low stress conditions really points to the fact that the steel here is not what it should be. Can't be helped. It's all within the parameters.
Yeah, too brittle. Too brittle. Either he hit it a bit too hard or didn't hit it enough. I don't know anything about the, the actual manufacture to that level. Yeah, Annabelle's got that too. Maybe like dropping a knife on the floor maybe didn't help. I wonder, you know, I wonder. I don't think it's like, uh, I don't know. Good old, good question, but I, I wouldn't think so. If I had dropped it on the tip, it would have broken the tip. The tip didn't break those two times I dropped it last week. It just fell, you know, on, on the haft. I don't think the shock would weaken the steel. I don't think so. This is now this is difficult because we've pulled it out and my muscle memory of the right angle to hold this is now wrong. And if I hold it at the same angle, because the blade is longer, think about this. If the blade was really long and I hold the same angle, we get a really, really, really acute angle. And that thing will break even more likely. So I'm torn now. I want to carve it, I want to sharpen it into a nice sharp blade. But given that we think it's really weak. That means I should pull the angle into a bit more obtuse angle. So I should lift my hand up. Not that much, but I should lift my hand up. That'll give a more obtuse angle, less likely to break, but not so good for cutting. Decisions, decisions, decisions. Okay, first shaping is okay. I've made it a bit more obtuse, and I've also made it not quite such a point. I've pulled it back. This print we're carving right now doesn't have a lot of teeny, 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 tiny circles. So I've tried to sharpen the knife here in a way that both of those angles, the angle, um, the angle this way, the one that you can see, the angle that way is a bit more obtuse, and the angle this way, the one that's really difficult for you to see, the angle here between the back and the bevel. I've made that a tiny bit more obtuse. And both of those things should help provide some strength to this. Flip it over. Lots of chat here, I'm sorry. Lots and lots of chat, I can't see it all. When you drop a pencil, yeah, I guess so. I could see that because the pencil lead inside a pencil at the point of dropping the pencil, I could see the pencil lead fracturing into a lot of tiny little pieces. So then it's going to be breaking all the time when you use it. But I can't see this steel. Just because I dropped the knife bang, I don't think that's enough tension on this steel to crack it internally. Could be wrong. Could be. I think we'll find out. We'll keep pressing away with this blade and after one or two or three more sharpenings, I think we will move to a different part of the steel, a part where it's less brittle. It's, that's the normal pattern. I mean, over the 40 years I've been doing this, I've seen this happen many, many, many times. There's just a small region in the middle of the blade that didn't quite catch the tempering properly, got overtapped or overheated or undertapped or something. It's very, very common. It's not just me, of course. I would have asked a sensei would have talked about the same thing. You know, up the length of any given blade, 
it's not going to be totally consistent in quality. That's my story. This needs dressing. This is embarrassing. Close your eyes. Don't look. This stone absolutely needs dressing. It's no longer really flat. If I had to do one of my larger chisels on it now, I would be in trouble because this stone is actually bowed a bit, the top surface. It's also scratched a little bit. On a tiny knife like this, it doesn't matter because from the, this, the knife is only four millimeters wide, so it's, it's effectively flat. But if I had a chisel that was as wide as this stone, the bow in it would mean that we couldn't properly dress the chisel. So I can get away with being lazy here because my knife is such a very small tool. But if I were sharpening planes or large chisels here all the time, I could not do that. This would have to be flat, flat. I think we're okay. Let's have a look. Let's see if we can catch the light and get a view of this. Let's see. Our main bevel, of course, just, just looks bright, shiny. The back side, we can see clearly now the f basically flat, quote, unquote, back. The hollow ground section in the middle which was hollow ground all the way up, of course, to the end of the blade. But as we come back and back and back and back and back, the tip of it gets flattened by the stone. And now that we've pulled it out, actually, something else I should do here. How can I do this so you can see it? I normally do it down on the desk. Hang on a second. Let's try this. The blades nominally are flat, but there actually is a slight curve to them. Imagine, imagine this is our blade that we've just bought. Imagine at the top here, it was the hard steel, the brittle steel, and the backside was the soft steel. The blades actually are a tiny bit curved this way. This is exaggerating. The brittle steel and the soft steel, when they come to me from the maker, they are a little bit warped this way, bent this way. As I put it in that slot, the fact that the blade is warped, it goes ka -chunk into the slot, which keeps it in place. Also, that warp towards the brittle side, imagine in my hand here, the, the warping, imagine this knife is warped like this. Then, when you put your blade on the back side, on the sharpening stone, because it's warped, the tip of the blade gets most of the action on the stone. If that blade was completely flat and the stone was completely flat, then when you rub it like this, the back side, then you would be rubbing away all of your hollow ground and you would not be acting on the tip. But because this thing is slightly, ever so slightly curved, it's curved this way, then when you're addressing the back side, that puts the pressure all at the tip. And then on top of that, you saw me at the very end, I lifted it up and put the tiny bevel in. And let's look at that again. You've got the bevel there. Let's try and find the light. Try and get the bevel to shine, just a sec. <laughs> it's in there. You can see it. There it is. At the very tip of the knife, there's a little bit of a shiny spot there. That's the bevel on the flat back side. It's the equivalent of Westerners using a strop to take away the burr on the back. We should write a book about this. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And now all this, and how soon is it going to break again? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> How soon is it going to break? <laughs> right away, probably. <laughs> you 
Yeah, there's lots of information about sharpening out there, lots of information. I think Terry McKenna, too. I don't know how much, I don't know what Terry knows about the traditional methods of sharpening, but uh, Terry McKenna, who's working up here in Karawizawa, he has written a book about sharpening the tools for making woodblock prints. It's an e-book. It's actually, we've got a copy on our website if you want to look at it, or go to Terry McKenna's website. I know the people out in, uh, in Canada, what are their names? Lee Valley Tools. They have lots and lots of information, books, PDFs, downloadable information. There's tons of information about sharpening. The Lee Valley people work at a level so far above my head, I can't even understand it. They've got electron microscopes and, you know, trying to figure out they're moving atoms around to make things sharper. I don't know. They're, they're at a level that I don't have any interest in. It's uh, irrelevant to me. We sharpen at a level where it makes sense to us. If we sharpen too much, the knives just become too delicate. And we're on the edge of this e even today, as you saw. Sometimes there's too much sharpening. Well, someone says stropping. I know stropping is done, to my knowledge, when you're sharpening a western blade on oil on an oil stone and bending a burr over, and then you, you leave, you don't take the burr off on the stone, you take the burr off with a, with a piece of leather or a strop. To me, the way we do it, actually, by not taking that, I would think that when you take the burr off with a piece of leather with a strop, you're just actually breaking it off. And I think if you were looking at the edge, you would see actually a rough, jagged edge where that thing has been broken off by rubbing against the leather. I don't know. By doing it this way, dry dressing it in water on that very, 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 very delicate stone, we're still part of the sharpening process. We're sharpening that bevel again, not just stropping it, we're sharpening it. And I would think that leaves a smoother, cleaner edge on this thing. Again, I don't know where we're, I can't see at the level that would need to be told about that, but uh, the Japanese system does work for our craft. It was developed and, and honed, honed and refined long before I came along, and it really, really does work well. I'm working here at a fairly, not low level, that's not the right word to use, but uh, I work at the level that works for our work. So, but again, people are talking about stropping and barbers and razors. I guess, I don't know, I've never done it, so I know nothing about that. I'm just simply following the way it has been done here, and it really, really does seem to work. Mm -hmm. Now, there's probably people asking already, should I make a relief cut or not? And I think I'm gonna do this next, I'm gonna go around this circle again with no relief cut, because there's priorities here. If I were going to dig deeply in, I would need a relief cut, but I'm not. I'm going to cut and scratch quite lightly. Why? Because for me right now, accuracy in this next section is more important than worrying about relief. If I cut a relief cut here first, then the knife will really, really, really want to wander. Because when a relief cut's in place, you move your knife down, the wood moves, and it's sometimes difficult to keep yourself on the line where you want to go. And I really want to make sure I don't cut this too thin here. So I'm going to score a very light cut here in the place that I want this cut to go. It's not going to be deep. We're going to have to come back and cut it again before we pull away the wood. But I'm more interested here in accuracy. I do not want to get that too thin should talk about this or not, I don't know. The other day when I was doing this, I did, I'm not going to use the word screw up, but I did. When I cut the inside of this loop first, I went around the outside, and I can't remember if I used a relief cut or not, but on the outside, I goofed. I cut in one place really, really, really too thin. Now, it doesn't matter because it's a piece of fruit, and pieces of fruit are not drafted objects. They get thick, and they get thin, and they get thick, and they get thin again. That's okay but it wasn't what I had intended to do. And we have here quite a fattish leaf, thinner than I want. And we'll have a look at it when we're, when we're getting the printing done. But on this one, on the outside of this persimmon, I do not want to make that same mistake. I do not want any razor thin places here. So I'm gonna play it safe, no relief cut, and do a shallow scratch cut first so that I get location. Location for me right now is more important than getting this wood cut efficiently. So we are going to have to come back here and cut it again before we can clear the waste wood. Yeah. 
I don't know, all it's just m m explaining to people that don't need this knowledge or don't want this knowledge or just talking too much, I don't know, but whatever. I really don't know the balance between general chat, technical chat, keeping quiet. Right there, we go. We come around this thing, and I have been. Uh, what's the word? I have been. Uh, I've made the line fat. I haven't been trying to shave this to a delicate, thin. Oh my God, line. I have plumped it up. I don't know if you can see it. I guess I don't even know if you can see it. The line is there. There's a little bit of white space outside the line. I have plumped this up. It's a big, fat persimmon fruit. There's no reason for it to be surrounded by a delicate flower-like tracer. It's going to be a deep, rich vermilion color. The printers want to bang at it. And the line work we had there was simply too delicate. So as we go forward through this thing, if we end up doing this fork too, we'll do the same thing. There's no reason for the bottom line here to be so thin. It can be plumped up. There's going to be a shadow below this fork anyway. This is part of the problem with the designs as they come from the designers. They don't, you know, they don't know about woodbot prints. They're just designing in a vacuum. And, uh, Well, the, somebody's talking about the scratch cut. Wow, wonderful, wonderful. There's a really, 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 really bad downside to the scratch cutting. Is that I have to go through the same place again. And it's almost impossible to get in the same place at the same angle. I've got to get the same line. So I can put my knife into the scratch. That's easy. But unless I have it at the same angle at the same point, and I don't know what angle I cut at, then either it will cut inside that line or outside the line. And quite often, when we've done a double cut, like a scratch cut, then cut again, clear it away, there will be little slivers of wood in there that need to be taken away. It's not optimal. It's not the way that it's classically done. If, if there was going to be one of the ground rules about all this stuff, is that for normal body lines, you never go over the same path more than once. You can do so on the straight lines with your ruler, scratch and then go in depth. But for normal body lines, you would never want to go over the same area more than once. So we're, this is compromise. It's all compromise, compromise, compromise. Is there any technique to take a fat line and trim it? Yes, of course, we do that all the time. You don't much see it on the stream here because what happens with the, the trimming is that after the print has been test proofed, we did this with the Nebuto Matsuri print. After the print was test proofed upstairs, it came down to me and I did this a little bit before making the color blocks. I took a proof of it. You've seen me do this a little bit actually. I took a proof of it, came back here because it's difficult to see because we're shaving black on black. That's why we don't do it too much on the stream because you can't see it. But yes, Shaving down lines is very much a thing as long as you remember your color blocks. Suppose we did this. Suppose I cut a real fat line here, got the test proof, made the color blocks, and the color blocks would match that fat line, the vermilion inside, the table outside. We then start printing. We then think, oh no, that's too fat, let me trim it down. Now you're in trouble because you can't trim the line down because if you trim it down too far, the color block may no longer match. So any trimming has to be done with careful consideration 
to how the color blocks are going to be carved. I really am talking too much and not working enough here. You know? Today's going to be a carving day for me though. Uh, once the stream's over, I'm going to stroll out, get a cup of coffee, take a break for half an hour or so, and then actually just come back. I have to work here today. So next time you see this on Monday, I don't know where we'll be, but you had better, if I, if I, unless I've screwed up, you'd better see some progress on this. I'm so nervous about breaking this thing right now. <laughs> Instead of going ka -chunk. I'm taking these curves in like six different steps. Something else I can mention actually, just in fun, not really related to the work. We did our AMA a couple of days ago, and as part of that, we had to work out a whole different setup for plugging in cameras and mics, because we had Skype coming in, we had different mics, whatever. So I was going through, I needed a, a USB mic input for the computer. So I was going through a box upstairs full of all computer parts and stuff like this. And as I was looking for that old USB audio input machine, driver, card, whatever you want to call it, I found something else. I stumbled across an interval recorder. Now, most of you, well none of you will know this, but when I first started the YouTube channel a million years ago, 10, 11, whatever years it was, it wasn't really about woodblock printmaking. I, I did show a little bit of the printmaking work, but I showed other stuff about my life. I showed some videos about the fish in the stream, the kingfisher and stuff like this. And at that time I had a clunky old interval recorder, which is what the Japanese call a, a time-lapse camera. It's a, it's a specialized device that takes time-lapse movies. Now, this is not some 4K glorious wonderful stuff. This is from 10 years ago. And I used to put it in my window upstairs in Ome and shoot the clouds. And most days clouds were not interesting, but every now and again there would be a really, really, really interesting cloud pattern where you'd get clouds going one way and another cloud going underneath it all day long, and once there was three layers, it was really, really, really good fun. Anyway, I found the interval recorder, dusted it off, battery's dead, card is only 500 megabyte card, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Put new batteries in, swapped out the card for something else, and thought, how can I use this in a Zaxa? Some of those, there's, I think there's three or four cloud videos there, and one of them is to die for. You cannot believe this is actually happening. High clouds come in, and they keep going, and then a storm comes in from a different direction and moves over and black and rain, and then it leaves, and the high clouds are just still going there. I don't care what's going on down there. It's really, really educational and interesting. Really, really interesting. Anyway, 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 I found the recorder the other day. So Thursday afternoon, I was sitting there with this recorder. So last night, for fun, <laughs> I stuck it on my balcony, sticking outside to the street below, set it, two minute, two second interval, just set whatever, I'm tired, sleepy, whatever, set, go, bang, and I let it run all night last night outside my balcony. And I haven't yet had a look, and I'm very curious. What did it catch? Is it people? Is it drunks? Is it rats running around? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, I set it, and I was going to run it for just like, a, you know, 15 or 20 minutes, whatever, but then I set it, and I fell asleep. <laughs> so I woke up this morning on the floor there, not even in bed. I woke up on the floor and remembered the camera, went outside to get it, and it said card full, and it had recorded a whole bunch of hours of, uh, of video of the street outside, which I'm going to look forward to having a look at. 
I'm not sure where I can use it. We really don't have a good view here of, of anything. You know, I, I can't see Sensoji Temple from here, stuff like this. But uh, Anyway, we're going to have a look at it. I'll explore the next few days, play with this, and uh, see what we can find. The approach I'm taking here right now, cutting fairly lightly, not cutting so deeply, might actually come back to bite us here at the time when this print gets to the printing process. It could be that some of these areas, like the one you just saw right now, I think we're okay. I think I've cut this deeply enough based on the kind of pressure I think they're going to be using when they do this. But it could be that because of my approach to, with this knife, I'm cutting shallowly, I don't want to break this knife. Because of that, I'm cutting shallowly and scraping shallowly. And this area right here could be maybe a little bit too shallow. Right up against a knife is no big deal, right up against the line, but out in the middle here, it could be. So this might come back to bite me a bit. And I guess what I should do, because I'm aware of this now, is I should perhaps shave down the inside of these places just a tad more than would be justified by the knife line here. Because if I don't, if I leave that a little bit too high, we're going to get our classic blurs and blobs on the print. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see. This is boxwood, very hard, but also very, I was gonna say very hard, but very soft very hard but very smooth and buttery boxwood. When you've got a good sharp knife, it just slices and cuts like butter. Any prospects for opening the shop? I have no news. I checked this morning the government's website which discussed the tourism situation. I have absolutely no news. I don't know. I have no inside tracks. All I know is what I read in the newspaper. There has not been a dribble of news. Uh, after the cabinet was set up, this was what, 10 days ago or so, Tishida San, the Prime Minister, gave a speech about our, you know, like, like the throne speech, whatever, in some other countries. And he really didn't even mention it. Didn't even mention it. Priority was to avoid stress and pressure on hospitals. So, don't hold your breath. I have no news to offer you, just don't hold your breath. The fact that there's no news about this could be that they are strongly wrestling in the back with the policy and maybe somebody's going to win and there'll be an announcement tomorrow. I just don't know. I'm sorry. I just don't know. So for us, we are training shop staff. We now have two people actively training and two, three more who want to work with us, three more people lined up. And we've said, look, I can't, you know, with all the shop, I can't hire you yet. But uh, if you can stand by and we can stand by, then let's just stand by. So we have three interested people standing by who are ready to jump in and start training and work with us at a moment's notice. So we have at the moment then five people tentatively available for working in our shop here. And these are not printmakers. These are people who have a general interest and knowledge in what we do who would then learn up and ramp up their knowledge about our products. And they would deal with the people coming into the shop. When I just I tell you, if I were running a hotel business, I would be so upset at the government and so steamed. 
make your decisions, get off your butts. Because a hotel, you can't do a hotel online, you know. We're running our business online, we're surviving, we're making prints and sending them out. But if we were a hotel, there must be bankruptcies, there must be just such a bloodbath. At this point now, there's really nothing else. It's indecision. It's just a lack of a Japanese government or people in charge to take charge and make decisions. It's one of the, it's one of those things about this country that's a real plus and a real minus. The consensus driven decision making. Nothing gets done until the consensus is in place. The, the benefit of this is that once the decisions have been made, everybody is on board and does work together. But the downside is nobody can step up to the plate and say, all right, people, I know you don't like it, but here's what we're going to do. That's just almost not possible in this culture. So. And the current Prime Minister, because he has political faction troubles, he is trying to organize a new faction. I know he's trying to organize how to work within the new faction system after Abisan's uh, assassination. And that's his number one priority. Absolutely. Personal survival. So everything else takes a second, takes a back seat to that. I guess that's the same in any country. We read American political news these days, and it's the same thing. Each of the individuals, their number one priority is personal survival, and then governance. Well, governance, what's that? Comes later. Democracy, eh? Where would we be without it? We're doing okay here, you know, quietly carving this. As long as I keep it shallow and keep it soft and don't stress the corners, it looks like we're getting some progress made here. Maeda Kentaro, the carver you see in that Hasui video that we linked, if he saw me working here, he would just think, it's nice, I'm visiting a kindergarten here today and uh, let's get back to work. Yeah. He would see me as a, a pleasant dilettante and he, he would turn his back and think, nice boy, but uh, you know, just doesn't get it. Hopefully he would have some respect for what I'm doing. He would have respect for, for the approach and for what I'm doing. He wouldn't have any respect for my technical skills. Whatever, it's okay. I'm here and he's not. <laughs> the story about the booze, I, I saw this go by the other day. I thought it was a scam. I thought it was like, is this April 1st? No, it's not April 1st. What's going on? I thought that story was a made up fantasy story <laughs> by somebody, and it's not. I know lots of repeat questions here. Have I done something about the VODs? We did talk about that earlier in the channel. Uh, based on hints that came from people in the stream here, I did manage to link the Mokohankan Amazon Prime account with Dave's actual Twitch account here. So the two have been linked. So Amazon, our Mokohankan Amazon account now thinks Dave's a gamer with a Twitch stream, but it seems that's enough. And it looks like they're going to keep the VODs for longer. The docs say 60 days is now the new limit. I don't know if that's true or not, but anything's better than the 14 days we've previously had. So yes, it could be that there will be lots more VODs available as time goes by now. I don't know. If we do have 60 days and I keep streaming three days a week as fully intend to, then we're going to have a whole bunch more than you can handle.
you think about the democracy thing, you know, especially as it plays out here in Japan, there's a sort of a, there's a really interesting way to, to look at this. If you have a society like, and again, I'll really, really, really generalize. If you have a society like Japan or typical European societies, let's just whatever, Denmark, you know, the, the kind of countries that we look on as being countries that are generally sort of the people are quiet and well organized and follow rules and like don't make trouble. Like we won't, we'll forget about 100 years ago for now. We'll just look at the way it is right now. I'm, I'm just blowing smoke here. Countries that are sort of well behaved people just quietly getting along with their business. If we have a democratic government, we go through our elections every three years, four years, one years, five years, whatever, and some there's a change in the the people who sit in the leadership chairs. One guy comes out, next guy comes in, one guy comes out, next guy comes in. But even though there might be party A and party B that might have a sort of a difference, the system rolls on, rolls on, rolls on. Because people who just lost the election, they know that, well, next time we'll probably get it. And also the people who are coming in are not going to do something to drastically destroy the system. So the point being, life goes on. There will be a change in government in a democratic country, which may change some tax policies. It may change some this or that, rules about this or rules about that. But overall, life goes on. And there is a viewpoint that, especially in a country here in Japan, where the government doesn't really actually make strong decisions because of what I said about the Japanese difficulty in, in actually making decisions, because the Japanese government doesn't really make strong decisions, it doesn't really dramatically change anything. Again, 100 years ago, we'll, we'll not talk about that. We're talking about current society as it is right now. The government is just really, in my mind, those people, they are placeholders so that we don't fall into something worse. If we didn't have a government, then you've got your military or dictator, whatever steps in, and then away you go. But if you do have a, quote, smoothly functioning democracy, then it's, those people are placeholders, and the rest of us just get on with our lives, do what we need to do. We expect the government to maintain the infrastructure, sort of do the technocratic thing, and just keep things running. We're not looking for strong leadership day by day by day. We're not looking for, for a power person that's going to come in and fix everything. And the government, to a large extent, is a placeholder. These guys just sit in their seats and take their turns and take their turns, and the rest of us get along, you know, just get busy with our work. That, to me, is a modern democracy working at its best. The government is a placeholder. Don't tell those guys. But they are just sitting in the seats to make sure nobody else comes into those seats and changes things. That's how I sort of see it. During, <clears throat> during most of my lifetime, through the 1950s, 60s, in most of these countries, America, Canada, Japan, the European countries, this is how the system has worked for most of my lifetime. Even America, they, their boat starts to go, whoops, it's going this way, but then it comes back, whoops, it goes that way. They sort of tip, America tips a bit more than a place like Japan or Canada or, or your Denmark or Germany would tip. But over the period of my life, America has also been part of this. They come and they go, the presidents come and they go and they make their tax policies, the next guy send it back to the way, and their boat goes a little bit woo, woo, woo compared to our boat here, but it does come back. So if this, if I'm sort of right with this, and, and I am right in the sense that this is the way it's worked during my lifetime, the open question now is, you know, America doesn't sort of look like that anymore. America looks like that boat is tipping a bit too far one way, and are we going to actually come back, or are we going to go over? And also, from the Japanese point of view then, having a placeholder government that doesn't really make strong decisions, that's okay when the world is a smooth, stable, not so dramatic change in place. But when things start to change quickly, when things go upside down, that's when you do need decision making. And a country like the one I've described, the Japan of that sort, is very, very ill-suited to making decisions. And it could be that these next few years are one of those huge global tipping points when the patterns that have worked for us for a couple of generations aren't going to work anymore. And the new pattern, we don't even know what the new pattern is going to be. So uh, that's kind of where I think we're at right now.
easy to diagnose it, but what to do to fix it. Like you can't fix it, all you can do is just, it's just going to come. It's just coming at us and at the individual level. There isn't anything, of course, we can do to, we can be good citizens, we can behave ourselves well, we can watch the environment, we can, you know, try and keep our own noses clean. But the big picture, it's just going to come at us. Too light, too dark, too light, too dark, whatever. There's an interesting idea tossed in, not related to what I was just talking about, but the slow opening of the, of the, of the borders here. <coughs> this is a thing in Japan. There are people here in Japan now who are actively saying, okay, we don't need to go back to that big era of wide tourism. I don't think anybody is actively saying we should actually try and seal the borders again. I don't think anybody is, well, except for the far-right loonies, I don't think anybody is promoting that. But there is a, a certainly a strong groundswell of common sense opinion here that says, let's take this slowly. We don't need to open this thing up all that fast. We're still sick here. We don't know what kind of variants are going to be coming. Let's just take this slowly. That is a very, very, very common um, mood, common opinion here in Japan right now. And governments being what governments are, they see this, they see the polls, and they're thinking, okay, all right, we'll think about it. We'll make our plan and at the moment just put it aside. This is why I said, those of you who are waiting to come, I really don't expect any strong movement in the near future. Near future, I mean, uh, whatever, as, as far as I can see here. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a flip a coin. I don't think there's going to be any movement in August. September, it's too far away, too much could change. I would say September is the earliest we'll probably see any change. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. What do I know about this? What do I know? I'm still checking every morning. There's a, a website that the uh, government has put up which discusses the, the border controls. And the last time it was updated was, the last time it was updated, let's have a look here. I've got it, I've got a tab. It's a tab open, July 28th. And at the time, the latest update on July 28th, oh yeah, they added Nepal, Moldova, Peru, and the Western Sahara. They took them out of the yellow category, and they put them into the blue category. Blue meaning the Japanese way of saying green, which is okay. <laughs> so, so that was the latest update, July 28th. So we've gone now nearly a month without any change in the immigration rules. <laughs> Another period of sakoku. <laughs> I don't, it's obviously not going to happen like that, you know. All non-Japanese citizens, you have 60 days to get out. We are going to trample your crucifixes. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, boy, oh, boy. <laughs> there would be some small group of loonies here in Japan that would actually want to see that. There's right-wing nutcases in every society, and there's a bunch of them here, too. Normally, they keep under their rocks, but uh, every now and then they come out. <laughs> I think it to its logical conclusion that if for Dave, is there going to be a knock in the middle of the night one day? <laughs> the government finally acted on this policy. We made our decision last night, and the police squads are now moving through the city to take all foreigners into custody. They will be escorted to the nearest airport <laughs> in the morning. I somehow don't think there's too much danger of that happening. But, uh, in your dreams. <laughs> I 
I shouldn't even joke about this. Someone's going to take it out of context. Here's what Dave was on Dave Bull's stream last night. He expects to have a knock on the door tonight. You know, I mean, come on, please, please, please. Please, please, please. Oh, show and tell time. Okay, okay, okay. We're getting work done. You can see what's going to happen today. You know, after the stream's over, I'm going to get my cup of coffee. I'll chat with Ishikawa-san first. She's going to work up there, and I am going to just work down here. I'm going to get my blue hard drive, which has got my entire music library on it. Uh, it's about 59 gigs, is it? I can't remember. I don't remember the number. 50-something gigs. I've got my blue hard drive. I'm going to plug it in here. I'm going to bring my headphones down, and I am going to have a music and carving day. Surfer Girl is here. Surfer Girl is right on the bench here. It unfortunately loses priority. It loses in the priority stakes to the one you're seeing. There is a deadline. On this one, we don't have enough carvers. This has to be ready in a week or so. Once I'm done this, Surfer Girl will come back to life on this bench. What kind of music am I going to listen to? You don't really want to know. It's kind of old-fashioned. I don't Let's talk about it later. Let's talk about it later. we got enough to talk about later. Let's talk about it later. I'm getting old. <laughs> I'm getting old. <laughs> One of the things, when I was working in Ome by myself listening to music, it was a point of pride. I am listening to modern music. I used to listen to the radio, and it was like, I'm listening to modern music. And then along came rap. Whatever. Anyway, 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 anyway. Okay, show and tell. Let's make some of these other cameras a little bit smaller. No, I don't mean oldies. No, 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 no. I mean oldies like oldies like you don't know oldies. Let's listen. Don't Dave. Don't talk about it. I'm sorry. We've got enough to talk about. It's a hugely interesting topic. Okay, those of you who have been following our Instagram know that uh, a few, a couple of hours ago, Watanabe-san posted a couple of prints to our flea market, and she talked about them on Instagram. And you guys have seen them before. She, sometimes, you know, I get stuff on, on Yahoo auctions, and I flow them through, and sometimes they'll take a year to get through, and sometimes, and she saw these four, and she said, oh my God, I really, really, really like these. I want to put them into our online web shop. And you saw these prints here, what was it, just a few weeks ago? I don't know, I don't even remember. We looked at them here. And I had actually wanted to keep these for myself, but she and I, I've been keeping too much for myself recently these days, and I had to flow them through to Watanabe-san for her flea market. And the reason I wanted to keep them is because I have this. I don't think we've ever seen this on the show and tell but it is hugely, hugely, hugely interested. My age is 70. I am 70, 70, 70. For a while, for a couple months longer. This is the Tokaido uh, Goju Sansugi, Zen, complete. And this is not Hiroshige, this is Hokusai Ga, Hokusai's pictures. The Hokusai, and it turns out that 20 years before Hiroshige did his Tokaido that is now super famous. 20 years before that, Hokusai himself did a set of the Tokaido. And almost certainly he didn't go down the Tokaido. He may have been to certain local parts of it. This is you know, supposedly a, a death portrait of Hokusai, by, done by somebody else. Hokusai almost certainly never went down the full Tokaido, but he didn't need to. All he needs is, is people tell him stories, he needs to have hints. And that's enough for him to go ahead and make interesting, pretty pictures with it. We have here the full set of Hokusai's Tokaido, but, 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 no pieces of wood were harmed in the preparation of the prints in this album. The original Hokusai edition, published, as I said, in the 19, up oh, in 19, in the 18, 1820, somewhere around there. They were woodblock prints back in the 1820s. What you're seeing here is, as I said, no pieces of wood were harmed in the production of it. 
This is an early form of lithographic offset printing here in Japan. We believe, I can't see the back of these, so I can't quite get to them, but almost certainly this is offset litho done on uh, plates for spot color. There's no half tones here. These are all done with spot color. You can see, where's my poker? You can see any numbers, any amounts of misregistration here. These things don't match on the mountain. These things don't match here and there. But overall, these are very, very, very nicely made. And I want to compare one of them with the woodblock print. And it'll tell us an interesting story. Where's Totsuka? Here we are. Let's find this. This is my book here. And on top of it now, I'm going to bring in the woodblock print version. Now, I don't have a Hokusai original from 1820. If I did, whatever it would be, it's, it's way too expensive, way outside of my pay grade. And also, we never, never, never see them uh, preserved in anything like good condition. What you're seeing here is uh, a pre-war woodblock reproduction carved on wood, printed on wood, you know, a normal, regular woodblock print. And I don't think they're metal key blocks, they're carved key blocks. But look at the mechanical version. The lines are sharper, the lines are clearer, the lines are finer. It's much more delicately made. This is a mechanical reproduction done with photography and done with mechanical printing. This is a woodblock print, which when we looked at it last week, we thought, hey, this is really made quite nicely. And it is made quite nicely, but you can see now why, just why, this is dead. We do it here because we're okay and we've still got a niche market for this, but you can clearly see just why and how mechanical printing methods did take over from the old woodblock work. It wasn't just a question of uh, efficiency in time and money. Yeah, I like the woodblock version too, but you can see the point when printing can be done this neatly, this cleanly, and this well at, you know, printing press speeds, bang, 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 then there's no way that something like this is going to be able to survive. Of course I like it better, there's no question about this, but that's why woodblock printing now is what it is. It's, it's a niche, of course, because it can't possibly survive against the machines. And this is not a new story, this is a hundred year old story. The machines took over for general commercial use and we can clearly see why. And this is a mechanical reproduction of a woodblock print It's very, very nicely done. And if I myself had no interest in the making of these things, if I just wanted to see the pretty pictures, this really obviously would actually do. Okay, rather than go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, let's have a look at Hawkeye's book. They weren't published in book form. How am I going to do this? Tell you what, let's, because I can't show full spreads at large size, let's do this. Let's get the camera set just to cut one of these sides. And instead of me flipping back and forth, back and forth, let's just stick with the right hand side for a minute. This is Shinagawa. And Watanabe-san, she mentioned in her update today on our flea market that the number one massive difference between Hokusai's Tokaido and the famous Hiroshige Tokaido is the people. Hokusai was interested in every frame. He was much more interested in what the people were doing. 
the landscapes are there when we go outside the landscapes are there but Hoxai's book is about the people if you had to describe to somebody else each one of these stations what's station number one your first discussion would not be about the landscape we can't even see it here in many of these the discussion would be about here's a bunch of people doing something where are they oh yeah oh yeah they're at that famous place and actually in a nutshell now that I think about it you could actually use this as your rationale why is Hoxai's name globally recognized as one of the greatest artists who ever lived and Hiroshige who is of course also globally recognized but he's a he's a beginner compared to Hoxai your man on the street everybody knows Hoxai and the Great Wave and Mount Fuji Hiroshige is, is lesser known and you might use this as the reason for it because Hoxai told stories Hoxai showed us people and this is the thing that we really want to see now having put that thesis on the table it all gets blown away by the fact that Hoxai's most famous image has no people it's the wave so I don't know I don't know I don't know I don't know these people are salt they're they're uh, they're scooping salt they're scooping seawater and of course you can see what's going on there's a, a pan they're they're boiling up the water for salt it's a salt factory There's still a place in Japan doing this. I saw a video about this. And a sea salt, I guess, is a thing for people who are into gourmet cooking and gourmet food or whatever. And there is a family in Japan. I think they're up on the other sea coast. They're up on the Japan Sea, in Niigata, maybe somewhere. There is a family still doing this, scooping up water and they scoop it they take buckets down to the sea and scoop it it's not like hoses into the sea spraying it there's buckets scooping it they lay it over the sand and they scoop more on the sand and they scoop more on the sand and they scoop more on the sand and after it's evaporated for x weeks or months they take the sand mixture put it into a big vat and boil off the water and strain off and i don't even know what they do there are still people hey we have a cat we have a cat. Stop everything. Hold everything. We have a hoxai. Well, I thought it was a cat. No, it's a fox. No, it's a cat. You tell me. I, I, I guess clearly this is intended to be a cat. But as usual, <laughs> somebody has got to write a book about this. The inability of ukiyo-e era artists to draw animals. Somebody's got to do this, please. Hmm, what's the story here? You tell me. Two travelers They've got their baggage behind them, more baggage than they can carry themselves. These are two travelers. And they don't look so happy, and the horse doesn't look very happy either. And he's holding one leg off the ground. So I think we have a story here. I think we have a story. I think the horse is going lame, or at least it's limping. And these guys have a decision to make, what to do. You tell me. I'd be depressed if I was looking at a horse. Yeah, so. And this is Hoxai. This is Hoxai. Throw a couple of people into the picture and it's a story. Here we are, another story. These are not ladders for climbing buildings. These are ladders for carrying people across the water. There's a negotiation in place. He's been thinking, can I walk without, nope. And this guy's saying, sure, we'll get you over there. Me and one of my buddies, we'll grab a ladder. And actually, I, know, I don't think actually there's too much negotiation here. As I understand it, the government did set prices for these things. But the prices were flexible because we had things like water levels. When it's not so much water, too much water, 
there's too much water. The guy's saying, look, I, I don't really want to go. This is dangerous. I don't really want to go. And this guy's saying, look, I got to get across tomorrow. Well, if you give me double the regulation price, stuff like this, presumably this kind of negotiation would have gone on. But the basic prices were, as I understand it, the basic prices were set by the government. Someone's saying it could be inspiration for a novel. It could be a short story in 55 chapters, you know? Don't get me interested. I've got enough to do already. It's funny you mention that because that instantly now reminds me of one of the plans my wife and I, when we moved to Japan, we came here in 1986. I wasn't making anything off printmaking. I was still studying how to make prints. We weren't selling prints. We were teaching English. We made some wooden toys. We had tried to get interest in some of the publishers doing English versions of manga. And we were trying to figure out how to make a living here in Japan. <clears throat> and I had an idea. My God, you know I did the story a week, story a week, story a week. That, that was after this. But Dave was good at like making little tiny short stories, 300 words each. And I had the idea. It never went anywhere at all. It was just never went out of our room. If you got in touch with the train people, they've got the little kiosks all over the train system. And suppose you work together with a group of writers and you had a writer who was doing a story for you and every day's episode, five days a week, Monday to Friday, was a 300 word episode in a continuing story. And we printed these and had them in the station kiosks every morning by six o'clock. Now it's possible, they have the newspapers there. People print newspapers and get it in the kiosks. People grab a newspaper and read on the train. This is before the internet. And I was thinking, if we have these 300 word episodes and they're printed on a little thing like about the size of a credit card thing that folds open and fits in your pocket, they're in the kiosk and they sell for 100 yen. It's one coin. And as the guy's rushing towards his train or he wants to read today's episode, he drops 100 yen in the pocket, grabs it, throws it in his pocket, sits on the train, and it's a little thing that will keep him busy for the next half hour as he goes through his train ride. And of course, it's a cliffhanger. He gets to the end of this, and then at the last moment, he jumped towards her and come back for Thursday's episode. And you could make a living doing this if you had a production company. They could be printed weeks in advance and sent out to the train stations. <coughs> I didn't do anything about it, just an idea. And then, of course, along came the internet, which has kind of made this all like kind of useless as it goes. But ideas, 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 ideas are cheap. And seeing this book now, this would be such a perfect theme for that. 55 episodes. I don't know if there are women carrying firewood. Is it rushes? Maybe they've gone out to gather rushes for making tatami mats, or whether this is firewood. I don't know. They're women out gathering stuff. The clouds, you're talking about the clouds. It's just a thing, forget it. It's just a thing. I think it comes from the Kano school, but I don't, don't quote me on that. It's one of the old Japanese styles of screen painting and clouds at the bottom and bottom. It's quote, mist, quote clouds. They were just used as, as part of the design. And also especially that you didn't have to worry about how to finish it off at the bottom or top. The spears in the rack here, these are not spears. These are the, uh, I don't know the technical word for them, but you've heard about the old parade, not parades, but the processions where the old daimyo, the feudal leaders, took their processions down the Tokaido coming towards the capital or away from the capital. And you see it in Hokusai, uh, Hiroshige's famous Tokaido series, the very first one. The two leaders of the procession are holding up these things. They're kind of a spear with a tuft on the end. And I don't know the, the derivation of what they mean. But here we have the same thing. There is clearly a daimyo's procession has coming down the highway. This is one of the post stations where they must uh, register and, and book in. And there's obviously a stand ready, placed. And the procession has, the beginning of the procession has come in. The guys have placed their spears in this stand. You can't just lie them down on the ground. And they're presenting their paperwork. Uh, dear honorable sirs, we request permission to pass from this post station. And my lord from wherever it is, request permission. And they're going to be here in about half an hour. And do we have your permission to go through and, and get going on this? It's, I think, the beginning of a procession uh, formally presenting their papers at a post station. 
oh, this is Arai. I've been there, and the post station is preserved. It's actually uh, still there, or it's been recreated. It's really, really, really good fun. <laughs> okay, we got to finish with this guy. We got to get going. I have got to get other work done. What is, oh, he's shoeing, I see. I was wondering, what's he doing at the back end of the horse? He's changing horseshoes. The horses had straw sandals, and as you can imagine, they're probably gonna last 100 meters or something. I don't know how far they would last. You carried with you a ton of extra sandals, and here he is, he's changing a horseshoe, which is not a shoe, it's a straw sandal. There must have been people, this must have been one of the ways for farmers to make a living, you know. If your farm was anywhere near the highway, there would have been any number of ways to make a living at this. Selling horseshoes, selling sandals, cookies, teas, you know, you name it. Collecting, you know, pee. You know, they used to pay people. A farmer would have buckets set up at the side of the road, and you pee in here and I'll pay you. He, he actually paid people. They would, the farmers would go to the inns and pay the inn for the sewage that was left there last night. It was so valuable. It was an article of commerce. Not a job I would want, but it was a thing back in the old days. That's part of the Hisakurige story we talked about. Anyway, enough is enough is enough. I have got to get going. I got a ton of work to do. Let's put up the outside camera. I suspect again I've probably talked too much today. I don't know. Can't tell. No idea. No idea. It's getting cloudy. It's going to be an overcast, steamy day. I am sweating already. My shirt is soaked. And somewhere in the afternoon, it's going to start monsooning. Vertical rain that will just bleh down over the city. Okay, I'll be back again two more days from now. And there's no doubt whatsoever about what I'll be doing. I will be working on that same carving job. See you in a couple of days. Thanks again to the mods for riding herd on this uncontrollable group of people who are watching this stream. <laughs> See you in a couple of days. Bye for now. <laughs>